Okay, I guess we will continue with our afternoon sessions. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, I'm Rob King. I'm with the Southwest Collection, the Special Collections Library here. And uh, we are at session D, that is the nature of travel poems. So we'll be hearing poetry this afternoon. Or I'll just introduce all three of them and then I'll let them uh, just trade off as you go. Sound good? So uh, first up, we have John Poach. He has published poems in the Paris Review, um, Poetry, The Nation, Southwest Review, and other journals. His fifth and sixth collections of poetry came out in April of this year, and he has taught at Texas Tech for 18 years. I was one of the students in one of those early ones, I think. Um, Matthew Porto uh, holds an MFA in poetry from Boston University. Uh, his work has appeared in Poet Lore, Salamander, uh, Story South, and elsewhere. He is currently a third year PhD student in creative writing at Texas Tech University. And then we have Lindsay Teague, uh, is the author of System of Ghosts, which was a winner of the Iowa Poetry Prize. She writes poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, and is a graduate student of both the MFA program in creative writing and environment at Iowa State University and the PhD program in English Creative Writing uh, at the University of Georgia. She's an assistant professor as well of creative writing and English at Eastern uh, New Mexico University and lives in Portales, New Mexico. And Julie. Okay, I'll start us off here today. Uh, I'm gonna read some poems about travel. A little bit of nature in there, too. Um, Elizabeth Bishop famously wrote in one of her poems, uh, Should We Have Stayed at Home and Thought of Here, uh, thinking about in the midst of travel. Um, because, of course, as poets, you have this imagination that can carry you anywhere, right? So uh, maybe you don't need to travel. Uh, the answer is no. Um, you need to travel. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are a few poets out there. Emily and Dickinson didn't wander too far from home. Uh, but I, I think it's probably uh, e any poet I've ever talked to that's traveled has come back changed, and their poems change, and, and for the good. And so uh, I wanted to start off um, this reading today uh, by reading a poem by a Spanish poet named Jordi Dose. And uh, Curtis, you might know him. Uh, he's, uh, his new book is called We Were Not There. Um, it's bilingual translation. And uh, I've traveled quite a bit to Spain uh, over the past uh, 15 years. And I found this poem, this is just out. And uh, I started reading this book just the other day and this one just kind of bowled me over. It's called Stone. I came to be close to the stone, the stone that waits in any path, anonymous and loyal, that saw suns, planets endure, remote marvels, that suffered the punishment of fickle winds and was stripped clean, simply dwindling, neglecting its own boundaries through the centuries, mumbling in dreams with a full mouth, the stone was within itself struggling to bloom. The stone that little by little became a lump, a granule, the dust of dross that the air carries far away and drops here where there is no path, dressed in my clothes and speaking in my name. I would love to write a poem like that one day. <laughs> I have a new book called uh, Texas's, and I'm going to read two poems. Uh, this, this poem is uh, called The Rio Grande South. And uh, there's another poem in the book about, uh, actually it's in the, uh, this other, the other book that I published uh, called Between Two Rivers uh, that takes place on the Rio Grande North in New Mexico. Um, but this is down in kind of wants to talk a little bit about borders, and of course that's so important to what's going on in this day and age. 
Casca bell of liquid days, weaving inaudible Zs in your long, slow passages, where your scales weigh in the balances, the light and grays reflecting quartz and dust. How do you fuse two visions into one tongue, forked now and then with such thirst, wandering through this long, brown chasm? With rain, you might wake and wash the foothills, for heaven's sake, rolling over stones, the ocotillo jealous of your distance, the roots of juniper and willow reaching to touch the ragged hem of your garment. Iridescent, as if risen, you leave behind your holy ghost. When I was writing this book, um, and I was trying to write poems consciously about Texas. I, I had come from publishing another book, and I had a bunch of poems left over. And I was like, well, what are these poems that I haven't published yet? And most of them were about Texas. And so I began intentionally writing uh, poems about places in Texas and culture in Texas um, where I hadn't been before. And so I traveled down south of I-10 and uh, wrote about Independence Creek and Love Creek and was kind of driving around down there and I came across the Sabinal River and uh, wrote this poem, it's called Escape on the Sabinal. Like a river we flashed and flooded to schools towards some imagined paradise as yearned our own kinfolk who fled their parents' rules. We were exactly right to go, those fools can't see. For us, back home is where the heartburn is was where romance is a butter churn. Humidity of the Texas hill country cruels the summer days with sweat while winters earn their solitude. Cold almost freezes, cools. So girls became our toys and books our tools at college. We learned to judge the jewel God is, saw Earth's insides like jewels burn and Eden lost was not so bad. Adjourned, we had traveled east. But snow helped us discern we missed the constant sun. The heat affirmed the good of cypress shade to rest our souls. Too hot? Stay still until the evening fuels a breeze. We know now we didn't know. Confirm this thread might lead us to original pools where we might lie among the spring-fed ferns and watch for the orangest orchard orioles. Our canyon loves, the city ridicules. To fish as well as fathom where food for a worm is to accept the river's unconcern. How it surrenders water molecules and rains, drifts, calms, distills, reflects, unspools, we leave as soon as we can, only to learn we spend our whole lives trying to return. And I'll read uh, one last poem. It's, it's kind of a longer poem. Um, it's a good maybe two and a half pages. So um, I've also spent a good amount of time uh, the past few years traveling to Italy and uh, thanks to Texas Tech, who has been pretty generous in um, helping me get a little extra funds um, to do so. And uh, I wrote this poem this summer, and I guess the only thing you really need to know is that uh, this, this poem kind of takes place on the island of Ischia, which is down off the coast of Naples, and um, the little town, um, that I re refer to at the very beginning of the poem is Casamicciola Terme, which means Terme is thermal because the island is covered with these thermal baths. A lot of German tourists go there. Um, it's kind of located near Capri, uh, but Ischi is kind of like the poor man's Capri. Um, the locals from Napoli come over, and um, like I said, German tourists, English, a few Americans. You don't see too many Americans there, which is really cool. Um, because when I travel, I like to get away from Americans. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's just about all you need to know. And, and um, this poem kind of takes place this summer. 
and it has an epigraph at the beginning. O death, where is thy sting? This poem's called Ship Rope. Casa Michela Terme's empty concrete pier is strewn with the remains of rope for tying all manner of boats moored here through the years. A local sailor might know how long ago each rope provoking an image from lost time. A particular storm, a hardware shop where the rope was bought, this boat, that mast, a woman in a white dress walking down the pier, her clean, round shoulders. She doesn't look back while every man watches her disappear onto a ferry, maybe never to return. Memory fails persistently this way. Green and pink, thin shreds of nylon cord, formerly blue and red, and massive, wrist-thick braided hemp tangled on the oily, rusty bollards of the empty pier are colorful remnants of the constant arrivals. But it is the going away, and maybe more the waiting to go that shreds the shorelines, which only seem to tether you to the truth of your days in sunlight. The edges of departure wear vaguely the strong sheet of a sail on the expanse before looming capri and mist, or here, the back of a sailor's grease-stained hand. One summer, you rented a boat with some friends and toured around the island. On one secluded beach below a cliff of volcanic tuff that seemed it could fall at any moment, you ate lunch at a great long table. Clams opened in buttery steam among spaghetti and fresh peaches floated in a jug of white wine. As the waiters in white came and went, you talked of the relief of not knowing the news from home. America, where families languished in the camps along the southern border and the stock market soared. At another cove, where you'd soaked in the hot spring, swimming carefully above the rocks strewn with sea urchins, your daughter was suddenly jellyfish stung. After the thrashing away, she swam hard, no tears, catching her breath, eyes wide, proud, back on the boat, relieved, the water now dripping from her bikini, her new body in the second year of her teens, which you turned from, as every father does from his daughter. But now you turned like a strong tide to caring for her hurt, spreading out the cool and glassy ointment on these little white islands risen from the skin of her tender inner arm as she flexed strong having survived and known this bitter sting, the welts gone in an hour. It was late June, and the sun was dropping behind the parapets of Castello Arganese. You said to yourself, to help yourself remember, a castle casts its shadow on me. Rich and poor, wet and drying on your rented boat, and afraid of your own future, you watch the poor boys jumping from the rocks and the shining, ghostly yachts of millionaires on whose decks rarely one appears. Money, your old worry, corrupting the peace. The boat turned that northeast corner of the island, bursting into western sunlight and waves toward Istia port. The deeper waters below the north face of the cliff sparkling blue as your daughter's eyes. You write to remember even the bitter sting. The sea is bitter, so much older than love or friendship, which down the line so often, let's admit, embitters, wears. That night after the day of sailing around the entire island, after drinking high on the patio of your rented villa overlooking the town, a festival with a jazz band played a fast so what. There would be beer, fresh donuts and paper cones of fried fish. The hum of human happiness called to you. So down the hill to town you wandered with one of your only friends who has lasted the distances of American states, religion or not, marriages, children, competing visions of a poem. Together you walked the lamplit streets looking for the local Amaro and found it again, brown, small in your hands and cold in your mouths, and sweet, you wanted it to last, the wild time bite of it. While a stone's throw away, little waves rocked the boats moored in the marina. Farther, 
Just beyond the sea, slowly eroded the jetty with power and salt, neither angry nor sad. You thought of that wide water, or at the edges of the island or inland where the hot springs for ages have been surging up through stone and the cleansing air. You wanted nature to care for you, your family, your friend. It doesn't. Nature feels nothing while time frays the rope. I'm going to read a few poems um, that have to do with travel, and um, the poems concern not only travel, but also encountering nature in foreign or distant places, um, as, you'll, as you'll notice. Most of the poems are quite short. I don't really know why I feel it's important to note that, but I will. Um, I do feel, uh, just by way of introducing the subject, that travel, first of all, for me, traveling does give rise to poems. Uh, it just does. I don't really know exactly why every time, but I do know that one of the dimensions of that process um, of going far from home and then writing poems afterward uh, is, is this experience of encountering, especially when very far from home, um, encountering philosophical and theological traditions that are very far from the ones you were raised with. Uh, or take for granted in your education and your upbringing. Um, and so a lot of these poems tend to sort of attempt to unpack that experience. So this first poem is uh, set in Taiwan where I lived for a year after I did my undergraduate work. It's called At Taroko Gorge, and it has an epigraph from the Gospel of John. He said to them, what are you looking for? Gripping the shallow riverbed, the cliff stretches upward, its sinews brimming with filmic tones of light and dark that empty into the silver sky where they end if they end. Mike and I drove the serpentine roads through the gorge all morning, parked to hike a path snaking out of sight like our adolescence and our faith. We saw what we knew of sanctity in jade water polishing the marble channel, in the blur of monkey crossing the road, ducking under a guardrail into deep green foliage. A trickster god, I said, off to pester one of the penitent tourists shuffling through lookout gazebos domed like cathedral naves. We reached a temple at the top. From the peaked roof, a bell hung its waist engraved with dragons, its lip guarding the clapper dangling in the center like bull parts. We stretched for the rope, my fingers grazed it, then Mike grabbed hold. We held it high together, then released. The gorge's throat pronounced the transgression as we fled our guilt down slope like children. At the bottom, overlooking the calabash curve of the river, Mike said he'd never believed in ghosts or gods, laughed, took off his shirt to feel what was left of the sunlight. But on the drive home, we called the site Eden, Jordan, water of awakening, as if we could only know it through myth. We cut through the cliff shadows, past gazebos abandoned by tour buses, into the flickering marble polish of river until the ancient quiet muscled us out. This next poem moves into Greece where I did a fellowship for a little over a month um, after finishing my MFA. It seems like my educational experiences are followed by travel as if I need to process what has uh, happened after it happens. Certainly that was true of the trip to Taiwan where I felt I just needed to get very far from all that was familiar so that I could read uh, the things I wanted to read. Um, and after the MFA, I was lucky enough to have a fellowship from BU um, to travel, and I took that to Greece. This poem is called Bone Faith. 
We'd hounded the sacred throughout Greece, among the moldered columns at Delphi, in the empty lustral basin at Gnosis, through countless barren village churches with their glut of golden icons and incense. We found the elusive quarry, hung in an olive tree on a Cretan hilltop, a ram's skull, its lipless mouth stretched into a grin, dry leaves clicking against the hollow bone, all of it smeared with dewy earth, even the rusted wire gnawing at the spiral horns. Totem, crucifix, we put our eyes in its sockets, from its vantage took in the decrescent hills cowled by clouds, by clusters of tamarisk and cypress. Below, among the blood-brown roofs of houses, a church lies like a hunk of bone tossed into the valley. That very morning, we had disturbed its old air. As we descended from that height, quiet as dust, our shadows pooled and ran down slope. Our tongues tingled as we coughed on sunlit dust and left the skull unclassified, unnameable, marinating in Cretan sun. This poem is also about that ram skull that we did find hanging in a tree. It was extremely um, spooky, as you might imagine. Um, so it took two poems and maybe more to figure out what that was all about. On a ram skull in an olive tree. Something of Carcosa on a Greek hilltop, the hollow socket a pit the devil bored for our gaze as our eyes level with the rim study the shape of the rot. At the lipless mouth, our legs go to jelly. Branches click against the skull. The nostrils, twin water drops hang, floating fossils out of time, fruit of olive underbelly. A church lies bone white in the town below us, but here we eat of other flesh, a victim not spotless but dry, caked with mud. Our tongues quiver as we descend, symptom of feral faith extracted from that tree old world knowledge, bitter pagan remedy. This next poem moves very far from Greece or Taiwan uh, to Austin, which is a place I uh, traveled to with my partner. Um, all of Texas is really a, a very far from home for me. I'm from Long Island, New York, so I uh, considered poems of travel as also poems that include places within the U.S. that strike me as, in some ways, just as foreign as other countries. This poem is called Parent Song Austin and is dedicated to Shay, my partner. You lower the straw from your latte. Leave a drop on the arm of the chair for a bee, and a refrain of movement begins. Circular hovering, then linear descent vibrato of wing, a drone note, silence feeding, your eyes shifting from the insect to my face. Your eyes and mine, wet as the bee's tongue, because these are the sorts of things we tear up over, these sappy scenes of nourished life. Lilt of turf sloping to patio, grackles picking at feather grass, even the skyscraper shadows animato with pedestrians. In the distance, the 360 bridges fermata winks over the lake. The bee must be sated, we think, since it flies off toward its comb, where what you'd given it proliferates in each hexagonal, murmurous cell. This next poem is also set in Texas, in Lubbock, actually. Fox and Dust. Last night, crossing the park, a gray fox stared me down from the Bermuda grass, then disappeared with three curled leaps out of the street lamp's glow into the dark. I don't belong here any more than cedar elms or Afghan pines or the burr oaks, their branches winded into jagged lines. I think of beloved Bible figures, their sandy skin, Joseph, who saw in the seclusion of dreams what provincials hate most, a destiny set apart from the collective and love for a foreign land and its people. The Arabic word haboob frightens some more than the storm itself. Cotton is an Arabic word. It's been cultivated here for generations, 
crimson too, the right epithet for West Texas sunsets that color the edges of clouds. The day after the fox stole into solitude, I lay in my back house, unable to describe the filthy shade rolling up the sky over the cap rock. What light did Joseph see drawn up from a dry well speckled with blood and spittle? Sunlight stumbles broken in oak branches, debris curls and leaps like something living, Haboob phantom, Afghan ghost, dust-born Hebrew, what ground will I stand on come morning? And I'll read one more poem, which is very new and has to do with Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley. The river mud on the Shenandoah. When I put my fingers in, you were nowhere. Then out of the clay, I brought your face, shaped it like a guitar, made the lips sing. The sun rose melodious over the river's steady undertone, its wrinkled surface brown red as tree bark with dashes of white as if stitched, as if the whole river were the wound on your head that I stitched on the deck of your family's home in Lou Ray, Virginia. That summer we were there together, one summer, and then not again. I left your face to dry on that deck. The next morning with sun filling the eye slits, with your song mouth full of sun, the woods turned to honey, and the leaves were caught there in eerie stillness. Out of them a sound came, a shriek and then the source of it, a gray fox, gaunt, spectral, its coat hung from it like a cloth. It trotted a few paces, screamed, trotted, screamed. If you and I were still talking, I'd ask if you'd ever heard a vixen scream, a high-pitched, grainy whine between a cough and a call note forced out of its body as if dry mud were in its throat. Somewhere in the woods, its mate hears it. I like to think that, although I never saw the mate. Thank you. Hello, thanks for having me here. I'm gonna read a couple of poems from my book, System of Ghosts, and then a couple of newer poems. <laughs> I'm just gonna set my timer. Okay, so when this book came out a couple of years ago, I did a couple of readings and a couple of interviews, and I got asked a question a lot about how I wrote so much about travel, and I hadn't really thought about it that way, um, but it's true, I do write a lot about travel. And I think what it is for me um, as a writer and as a teacher, I'm really interested in writing from a place of curiosity and kind of thinking about po a poetry of curiosity, both curiosity about the places that I go or am, but also about the context that those places exist within. So um, one of the things that I've been trying to, to write about is both places as I experience them, but then learning something about them as well. Um, so this first poem talks about travel specifically from a young teenage point of view. Uh, it's called Trajectory of Oranges. All night in the train car to Valencia, the young couple speaks Italian, propped on elbows in their bunks. Their whispered joy hovers like a tent. They are a skylight above me. I catch words, snatches of sense. I am teenaged and thrilled by history. Now the couple peels oranges, one, then another, another. They citrus fill the compartment with noise and snack. They hand slices near the ceiling. They drop rinds like shed chrysalis, like discarded drafts, like we may all become new before long. I may never think beyond oranges again. Their smell sharpens the air, perhaps we are like explorers bringing fruit to Iberia. We travelers, like royalty. We are Europe in the 17th century. Citriculture is for kings. Or we speak Middle Im English. Rename this color after crop. There is no longer yellow-red. Let us navigate, creating seedlings across an ocean from Spain. In Bahia, we'll celebrate the birth of navel oranges. 
It looks like Umbigo will say, the button of my belly, who ate the first orange, the new hybrid of Mandarin and Pomelo, and that corner confluence of India, China, Burma, whatever land was there then, this taste for new food, maybe I carry memories in my tongue. I am young too, I could tell them, and can I be like you? I will speak citrus, I will claw at the peels. The train roars across track and I want orange dust near this skin. This poem is called City of Light and it begins with an epigraph by Rebecca Solnit who wrote one of my favorite books, Wanderlust, A History of Walking. Everything, houses, churches, bridges, walls, is the same sandy gray so that the city seems like a single construction of inconceivable complexity. Do you remember the front door painted blue? How it even rained, but we stayed in the hotel perfect. At the tower, they wouldn't let us go up to the top, only the near top. And you padded the beams, joked about structural integrity. I've never seen a place like this, you said. Do you still remember my terrible French? Coming back from Versailles, we couldn't wait to peel those rain-soaked clothes. I can't be sure. All my you memories become one sprawling city. Was it on that trip you mimicked the poses of statues we saw in the park? On a different trip, that night it snowed. We stopped at an Indiana motel, drank a bottle of wine naked, dripping on sheets. I stayed there again once, alone. Out the window, cars, cars rumbled away. It rained and the power went out. The building noises silenced with drawn out whirs like breaths. This is the title poem of my book and part of it comes from the fact that I lived in France uh, right after I graduated undergrad. Um, and again, it connects to a lot of different things because I teach and I write from that place of curiosity and I think what travel does for me and why it ends up in so many of my poems is because that sort of level of attention that you get from the amazement of travel is the kind of attention I'm looking to write about in my poetry. We are a system of ghosts. We are a system of ghosts is what a man says in a documentary about his city at least, that's what I remember, he says. When I rewind to find his words, I'm not surprised that I can't. Once, before I lived there, my mother brought me to Chicago, and we laughed through downtown like girls. We drank wine and ate pasta. A few years later, we tried to find it again, this best ever place, but we'd forgotten the sidewalk to turn down or the way the restaurant's awning threw its door frame in shadow. My mother protested, but these streets are a grid. She studied the map pressed flat to her knees. I think of all the maps of countries and borders that no longer exist. In France, I lived near, near the site of the Ligne Maginot, that line of tankers and casements in World War II designed to keep Germany out, the countryside dotted with armored cloche of alloyed steel, the machine gun turrets retracting into the ground, this vanishing reminds me of informal cities, the claimed settlements that appear along abandoned rail tracks, the spaces people fill and empty. The woman in the apartment below me has birds and they squawk in greeting when they see her as if to say, oh, there you are. I listen as her front door slams each day. Maybe she watches as I wait for the bus, my eyes shut tight to the wind. Two. I once saw a photo of someone stranded in an Iowa blizzard, a figure covered in flurry, the white sleeting lines erasing all edges of body, hopper solitary in the flatness. A year later, I couldn't even begin to locate it in a book or museum, couldn't remember anything at all except snow. Most days, half the mail I get is for others, or it isn't even addressed to a name, current resident, I pile it all in a shoebox and keep it up away on a shelf. Most days, I want to research a trip somewhere new. I look up the logistics, the to and from, the airport, the taxis, the buses, and trains. 
I will always know what to do if I get there. I want to go somewhere that requires goggles to protect my eyes against snow blindness, to avoid flash burns of the cornea. They say it is like an eye full of sand. Do I enjoy the feeling of standing in a field full of it alone? Polar explorers treated this exposure with drops of cocaine in their eyes. I researched that too. Visitors to Antarctica still arrive by sea on a boat from Ushuaia, the southern tip of Argentina. Thousands of people go each year wanting to witness that which disappears. I see them trekking over ice. On my daily walks home, it's not winter yet, and I can only retrieve what's fallen. I collect buckeyes, pine cones, horse apples, walnuts. I fold and store leaves like small paper receipts. Three, the moving trucks all came on the same day. In Lakewood, California in 1950, a new suburb began. I imagine the trucks unloading, they're leaving, unpacking, people in new structures, here we are. In the 1950s, single ha family homes diffusing on treeless plots near highway, so many residents could wake up and feel somewhere. In an Iowa coffee shop on the edge of once prairie, I write long overdue letters to friends. A little girl approaches, sticks her head in my lap. She taps a key on my laptop. She types a series of O's. This is a ghost story, she says. Is it scary, I want to know? She types E, 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 E. I ask, is somebody screaming? I'm gonna read one more from this book. And this one is called Michigan Central Station Has Been Closed Since 1988. When I go visit you on the edge of an actual mountain in Colorado, we take the cog railway to the top, tooth rack rail that jerks and chugs. We pay $30 to go up and down, and the grade steepens, and a baby cries, grabbing her ears. But we pass some of the oldest trees on earth, ancient bristlecone pines I know we'll forget. Past Timberline, the train inches, and I wait to roller coaster up away from here. But we reach the top, and the conductor says, 40 minutes, points to a concession stand selling nachos, and we hate nachos. But you love trains, you say, and I tell you I do. That night, we eat at Pizza Junction in an old sleeper car. The food isn't great like we want it to be, and I touch the wall's wood paneling and ask you, why can't all the stations become train stations again? And you say, while we're at it, let the mountains be mountains. A week later, I leave you and fly home in the dark to find spilled vinegar in the kitchen and for a moment think it is blood. I sit on the floor, looking at the stain I'll have to scrub best I can from the linoleum and stare at the guilty cat as he jumps from counter to floor and stumbles his landing and licks his leg. I love to catch an animal pretending. That night, I don't even tell you I'm home. I leave my packed suitcase on my bed, unlock my bicycle, and ride toward empty tracks toward the nail salon in the old depot. I look for hills. Midwestern land isn't as flat when I'm pedaling. I wish I could bike all the way to Detroit to the old abandoned station that looks like the end of time. You once told me that in 1912, it was the tallest rail station in this world, that it was modeled after ancient Roman bathhouses. I stop in front of Happy Nail Spa, where a woman sits in the dark sanitizing clippers, and I stand over my bike and pick up a discarded pop can shake dirt on the toe of my shoe, and try to remember the last time our faces touched. I watch the sign's fluorescent end flicker and buzz, and I dream up trains flashing past me, and I see all those passengers like ghosts crowding the station. I see people rushing in and out of a place at all hours of any day. I'm gonna read a few more, more recent poems. I'm not a student anymore, but the experience feels very recent because I just graduated with, from my PhD in May. And through that experience of both my MFA, my PhD, and then moving here, I've lived in a lot of different places in a relatively short amount of time. So a lot of my poems aren't really travel necessarily, but they're places I'm, I always feel new and to a place. So they're, they're about exploring those places. This one's called Comprehensive Exams which some of you might relate to. <laughs> it smells like soap in the room today, and do you all practice dying, a professor says, every night. And last night when the power came back on during sleep, I woke to the lights on, all of them, heat humming from the vents. I mostly try to remember why I'm here, why I love what I do. 
For my PhD exams, I compile possible questions and I read and read, and in the classes I teach, I tell my students to think of questions with much more than answers. My new online date takes me to the tree that owns itself, in Athens, Georgia, in such a place. Do you always feel the need to express yourself, he really asks me. Do you make me feel more alone, I ask him. In Savannah, I saw boys pull overripe lemons from the tree with a hasty joy, a good fire. It was present, 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 like around the sharpest versions of you. On my own, I saw a bench on a hiking trail in Puerto Rico that looked like a bus stop in the rainforest, such waiting and going. And I am often asking, is there even longing on this syllabus? Um, I'm just going to read one more, and it's one of the first poems I wrote kind of grappling with this new landscape I find myself in, and other stuff. <laughs> it's called Late Presidency. It is the time of late presidency. It is always late presidency. It is a time inside. I start searching for people laughing. On television, in the aisles of Walmart, outside the car wash, I see there are jokes, and I hope these jokes punch up and not down. But in the time of late presidency, it is hard to say. Was there a time before late presidency? Will this time of late presidency continue? I find myself here during this time in a dry stretch of west, driving to Albuquerque tarantulas scuttle across highway. In my backyard, new swallows dive through my porch, ants circle my sparse grass. In the time of late presidency, my dog develops a scream. He hates to be alone, and all day long he screeches. I am out explaining words to late teenagers. I am out com completing active shooter training, checking my windows for locks, wondering, should I keep a hammer in my bag? I may need to break glass to get outside. I am out in the time of late presidency. My, my dog calls and wails. He is wanting me back inside. Thank you. Directed to all, all yeah. the others. Yeah. You're looking to Yeah. <laughs> I'll start. Um, but a lot of that takes place rather mysteriously uh, in my experience. It's sort of you travel, and you see what you see, and you have the impressions you have, you make some notes, and then eventually those seem to turn into poems, and I think so much of it just has to do with the fact that they, these experiences of travel are so extraordinary. You see such extraordinary things, you feel such extraordinary things, that you continue to dwell on them, whether you want to or not, the sort of trace of them is still in your mind, and therefore when you go to write, it's natural that the things that you've been dwelling on for so long, the images that won't go out of your head, not that you want them to, but they're just there, and naturally those are the ones that have been rounded out the most over time. That's how I would describe it, um, or at least part of it. Yeah, I just always take notes, usually on my phone in the notes app, and I find when I'm traveling I take more notes because I'm more observant and I'm more attuned to what's different from everyday life. And so whenever I compose a poem, I'm kind of just like bringing those notes together and seeing what speaks to other notes from other times. And so, um, yeah, I think, honestly, it just starts as a series of notes. I think part of it for me is just the defamiliarization of travel. Like in Lindsay's poem, you know, you've got an orange, but you know, it's like on a train to Valencia. You know, so that's like an orange becomes, <laughs> it's like this other thing, right? And you start thinking about it and uh, meditate on it. If you're a writer, you're trying to find words for it. So I think that's part of it. I think everybody's got their own different processes. You know, um, my summers are really valuable for me for writing. During the school year, um, I'm kind of dedicated to my students quite a bit, so I just I can't get much written. Um, 
pretty good teacher in that way, I hope. Um, uh, some of my teachers were not that way, dedicated, and they were just writing all the time. Um, but I feel like dedicated to my students. Um, and so I, I'm really on a mission to get some writing done during the summer when I'm traveling. And so I just, I think it's just, just putting your nose to the grindstone, you know, and just pen to paper and just getting it done. Uh, doesn't always turn out great. You're writing out poems, out like Stephen Graham Jones was saying, you know. You're writing a story a week, and you got 52 stories, you know. It's like, get to work. So related to that, uh, Lindsay, a lot of your poems seem to be about vanishing empires, the impermanence of civilization. I'm curious, going back to this idea of a place on Earth, where is your poetry leading you uh, as far as that's concerned? Or is the answer read the poems? Uh, Do you feel like you have a place? Oh, um... <laughs> I mean, I, I'm from Michigan and my family's from Michigan, like from generations back, so I do feel like Michigan is my place. But uh, I, I like, I also really enjoy the experience of getting to know new places. So the fact that my career path has sort of taken me on this peripatetic journey hasn't really been, you know, it's been, it's only helped my poetry to be in all these new places. I don't know if that answers your question, but I feel like I have a place, but I'm okay with not living in my place. Uh, do you write when you're in the moment, or is it upon reflection when you come back? I mean, you know, when you're there, there, is that when the poems come, or when you come back and say, wow, you know, when you start processing what, what took place? I never write in the moment. <laughs> okay. I'm kind of like a words worthy and recollected in tranquility. i got to get out outside of that moment. Um, so I don't, I don't ever sit there and just generate a poem while something's happening. Um, I'm, I just never do that. I'm not against it. I think so other people might do that, but that's not me. I write those notes I was talking about, and for a long time I didn't count that as writing. Okay. And then you know there was a period where I was moving and graduating and um, you know doing my PhD dissertation where all I was writing was those notes. And then I started thinking about, that is writing? I was writing. I was just writing in these brief moments in my phone, and it needed a lot of revision. But So I think I do, I do both. You know, I, I write the starts of ideas and images sort of out when things are happening, and then I come back and form them together into something that actually resembles a poem. Yeah, my practice is about the same. I, I, I always have these, I don't know about you both, but I always have these ideas that I'm going to sit somewhere distant and, and write all the time. You know, I'll, uh, I'm spending nine days in France as I did once, and oh yes, of course I'll spend the whole time, you know, eating a croissant and uh, drinking an espresso and writing, right? But I didn't get any writing done because there were just too many other impressions that were sort of pulling at me, and that was fine. Um, so it, it was just an, on a practical level an impossibility for me. Um, while traveling, there's too much else that needs attention, um, and I, I do need a level of tranquility to reflect on these things. So, yeah, it's usually well, at, well after the fact, sometimes years after the fact. This is for all of you. Are you ever able to travel or take this perspective that you're talking about? You know, I mean, 
being in some place foreign and impose that upon a local place where you're you're traveling within Lubbock or Port Alice or you know wherever it is you're from. I'm thinking about a book by this physicist Chet Ramo called A Path, a one mile walk through the universe. Mm -hmm. And it's this path that he walked every day for like, probably decades, right, to to and from work. And how he was able to see the world in this one mile path, right? And oftentimes we're looking out and saying, oh, you have to get out and you have to do this grand journey. But at the same time, we don't understand where we are right now, right? And so I'm curious about how your own location, where you're living, the place you inhabit, how that comes into your travel right now. Yeah, I can say I, I uh, went in Spain off and teach uh, the Odyssey, which I think is the greatest travel poem of all time. Uh, and of course, this is, has all these adventures, but they kind of all, they only point to one thing, and that's him getting back home and trying to figure out what home is in relation to that travel. And I think all my poems are about that. Um, I also teach Elizabeth Bishop's um, Questions of Travel, which is very much about that, about trying to figure out what home is by virtue of being, say, in Brazil, um, and trying to get back to that understanding. Well, what is home? What is home? What is, what is that one mile path? Um, and so, um, I think that's a big part of travel for me. I mean, I love the kind of exotic experiences that you have, like eating spoliatella <laughs> on Ischia, like this little pastry is like the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. Just having it every morning, well, almost every morning. It's pretty rich, you have to take a break. Um, but, you know, it's like, you know, uh, I, I can't. That's not why I go. It's like I, I go to have that experience, then to just really find out who I am back home, where I'm, where I live, and where I, where I spend almost all my time, where I'm raising my kids. Um, it all comes back to that. Yeah, I think a lot of my poems talk about both. Um, the uh, my red system of ghosts. It's like part of the poem is in Argentina, but part of it is on my walk home, collecting things. I think it's about there's a way in which it's easier to cultivate a certain amount of attention and observation when you're traveling, but that doesn't mean you can't do it in where you live and where you're familiar. Like uh, John was saying, the defamiliarization of travel is something that allows surprise and that kind of deep observation to come in, and I think there's a, there are ways that you can achieve that in your home. And like I said, I feel like I'm constantly new places, so I haven't yet lived somewhere for long enough where I feel like I even need to like work that hard to cultivate that surprise. I, I love your question, Curtis. It's a really good one. Um, it, uh, I love also that that Lindsay that you linked um, and talk, spoke about attention. Uh, you know, as if as if travel is an occasion for you to you realize, oh, now I need to pay attention. I'm at the Parthenon or whatever it might be. Um, but, but I love your question because of course we should be doing that always. And of course there's a tremendous amount of mystery no matter where you are. I mean, like that uh, physicist, was it? Um, you could take that walk a thousand times and there's still more um, going on. And, and so certainly this is something that I feel like, maybe not in those terms, but maybe it should be in those terms that I think about a lot. Um, and to attempt to answer it, I would simply say that uh, it, it does have to do, I think, with, with with sort of ways of seeing what, what's around you. Um, I mean, I sit in my yard a lot, and there's a lot, there's a lot going on in my yard. Uh, there's a tremendous amount. Um, and so I, I'm often trying to uh, figure out uh, what bird is that, uh, what's it doing? You know, that's a sort of more immediate level of just literally figuring out how we name the things around us. But I think in light of your question, it should go even further than that, than that into saying, do I even really know uh, what a bird is, <laughs> or or uh, what this space is that I'm that I'm sitting on. Uh, what's beneath my feet? What's what's above me? I mean, all of that is just really is good. But anyway, an occasion to think more about it. Good question. I'm trying to think what the opposite of a poem triggered by travel might be. Not like a poem triggered by 
looking at the same four walls, but like like a Yelp review seems to be the opposite of a poem. <laughs> <laughs> so like when you're when you're writing a poem, Tricky by Trauma, are you thinking I'm not doing this? Do you feel like there is an opposite? Do you feel like I'm doing a, a richer rendering or something than this other response to a place? Yeah, well, you know, the Yelp, you're right, is, that's the opposite, okay. um, okay. for sure. Because you're saying, I know what just happened to me at this restaurant. It was amazing or it was horrible, right? Um, those are probably the two things that spur you to actually write that. Um, where I think in travel, it's like, you don't know. You're writing about what you don't know what just happened to you. Like, why is this so amazing? Or, you know, or, or why do I feel this longing for a home in the midst of this space? Um, and poetry, so I mean, that's the one of the first things that I ever learned about poetry from a poet named David Bobbins. He said, he said, poetry isn't about answers, it's about asking better questions. And I don't think the old reviews are really about trying to get at better questions. Yes? I would say it doesn't matter if it's accurate. Um, not in a poem, uh, for me. It's it's um, if I want to know what actually occurred, I would I would be reaching back to photos taken um, or notes taken at the time. But when I'm writing a poem, it's a very different thing. And what I'm trying to get at is is something else. And it tends to be for me. It, what tends to happen is that the language itself begins to suggest where this experience is going to go. And so if something needs to be introduced that's not, that wasn't present there, but somehow is more true, then, then I allow that to happen. Um, it's a difficult question because, it, it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of question that will, will perpetually be interesting. You know, how much of actuality needs to be in the, in the poem? Um, but it's not nonfiction, right? I mean, it is, it is a, 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 a sort of subgenre of fiction in some ways, and think about a poem. Um, so yes, uh, I'm not concerned about the fallibility of memory when writing a poem, but in my everyday life, I'm very concerned about the fallibility of memory. <laughs> um, when I'm trying to remember for myself that experience, it, yeah, that bothers, that bothers me quite a bit. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure if you... It's an interesting question. <laughs> okay. Last one. This is going to be open for uh, anyone who feels like they were on answer. Um, so, all three of y'all shared these wonderful experiences about travel. I'm an advocate for travel. I definitely think it's a wonderful experience. Um, Dr. Fosh, I've heard you also have been to Italy. It sounds like you go there pretty frequently. So, for any of y'all that travel back to a place that y'all have been, do you feel like y'all see new inspirations, maybe from new interactions, new foods, new drinks, uh, colors? Do y'all feel like that plays a part into your work, or have you ever reread a piece and feel like you can still make that connection, or do you feel like it evolves the more that you visit a place that you've been to? One of my great obsessions is the way that places change, and <laughs> when writing about those layers of place, so I love visiting a place more than once and thinking about what's disappeared. There are places I wish, or I, I look forward to returning to, I mean, big ones, like Taiwan. Um, uh, this actually just came up earlier today. But anyway, that, you know, I look forward to, uh, but I always think to myself, well, 10 years from now, I'll return and see what that place looks like. So, but for the, so the place I'm writing about here, I haven't returned. But I, look for, but I do feel like there's a tremendous amount of power in a return to a place. Um, it just gives you an occasion to realize what's changed there, how much you've changed, perspective shifting, um, and how your memory remembers that place and how it's different from what you actually see. But I can't speak to it for the for the subject of my poems because I haven't gone back yet. But I want to go back to each place. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a kind of hope that things will change. I mean, you come back and experience the same thing. Um, 
there's not much to that. Um, I think the truth of the matter is, you know, it's a, in the same way that you can't go home again uh, to the same place that's home. You get there and you go, wait, this isn't where I grew up. Uh, when you travel, you go back to the same place, and certainly things are going to be different. Um, I think sometimes we want that deep feeling of like, because if we've had an amazing experience in a place like Taiwan or Italy or wherever uh, through travel, that we want to have that feeling again, but not exactly. I think we want something above and beyond that, you know? There's that nice repetition, but there's always got to be more. You know? <coughs> and if it's kind of pretty much the same, it's a little dissatisfying. So, you know, I'll go back to Italy, but I need to change it up. I need to keep going to different places and discover different things. So, anyways, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you.